Hi. Uh, we're running a little bit late, but we'll try to uh, catch up. I have uh, some good news and some bad news. The good news is that I'm about to introduce one of the real stars in this field to reduce obesity in the United States. The bad news is that our second speaker during this period was unable to make it today, Barry Popkin, but he will uh, be around tomorrow morning and we've squeezed him into the program then so he will give his presentation tomorrow. Uh, so now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Kelly Brownell. Kelly is a professor of psychology at Yale University where he also serves as director of the Rudd Center on Food Policy and Obesity. In 2006, Time Magazine listed Dr. Brownell among the world's 100 most influential people in its special Time 100 issue featuring those, quote, whose power, talent, or moral example is transforming the world. Kelly was elected to membership in the Institute of Medicine in 2006 and has advised the White House, members of Congress, governors, World Health and Nutrition Organizations, and media leaders on issues of nutrition, obesity, and public policy. And now he's about to advise us. Thank you. And uh, Kelly, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, George, for that kind introduction. When I got a telephone call that I was being named to the Times list of 100 most influential people, I first thought it was my college buddies playing a joke on me. <laughs> and then I went home and, and I explained this, and, and my, uh, my daughter said, Dad, you're not even the most influential person in our house. <laughs> <laughs> so kids can humble you in very interesting ways. <clears throat> Uh, I'm delighted to take part in what I think is a historic conference, and hooray for CSPI for pulling this off. Um, yeah, let's... You know, Mike Jacobson was one of the first out of the gate on this topic many, many years ago, and has been just completely solid in his pursuing this issue. And then George and Julie and Margot Wutan have done such wonderful work on advocacy and policy. It's just a wonderful group of people. So I'm happy and delighted to take part. Um, this morning, the Washington Post has three full-page ads by the soda industry. Do you think we have their attention? <laughs> I think we do. Uh, it's really a very interesting point in history now with courageous actions by Philadelphia, by New York, by California, and a number of other places dealing with the soda issue. So I'd like to talk about several aspects of this. When I uh, heard that Barry Popkin wasn't going to make it, I was asked to put some more slides into my presentation and then told we're running out of time, so we're going to do the original one, so I don't know what in the heck I'm doing up here, <laughs> but we're going to give it a shot. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about is part of the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity, and I have a website circled there on the slide because it's a website rich with information on food policy issues, and we send out a newsletter regularly if you care to receive that. And we've also recorded a variety of podcasts with really terrific people uh, that one can listen to in the food policy arena. Uh, and my colleague Roberta Friedman is here who directs our policy work, so I hope you get a chance to talk with her. One very interesting issue in addressing the obesity problem is whether it's more a function of getting good food into systems or removing bad food from it. And it's quite the easy path to take these days to focus on healthy food systems. Getting more food to people in underserved areas would be an example of that. The question is, is that likely to help with the obesity problem? Or do we really have to go after the bad food? And of course, sugared beverages come up in this context. So the non-articulated assumption in this whole dis debate is that somehow if you get good food into the system, bad food will leave it, and there will be a calorie deficit, and weight will be lost. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any effect at all. But when one really gets in and examines this, it appears not necessarily to be the case. So good food and, and bad food may not be on the opposite ends of a, of, a, of a pivot point like this, that as one goes up, the other necessarily goes down. 
So it's possible that introducing healthy food into systems will not displace the unhealthy food and there will be a calorie advance rather than a calorie retreat. We don't know this for sure because the science is not conclusive, but some very interesting things have come up in the scientific literature. Uh, this study published in the New England Journal of Medicine by colleagues at Harvard showed that in a 20-year study on the determinants of weight gain, that it was consumption of unhealthy foods that was a stronger predictor than the absence of healthy foods in the diet. And then a group in North Carolina with Barry Popkin involved found that proximity to fast food restaurants was a stronger predictor of obesity than was the absence of living near supermarkets where one might have larger access to healthy foods. Now there are lots of reasons to push healthy foods into the system, of course, for a variety of reasons other than obesity. Social, just reason, social justice reasons alone are very good reasons to pursue this, but it may not help with the obesity problem. And so in terms of obesity, we have to ask ourselves which of these two paths is more likely, this one or this one, and it looks to me from the scientific literature that this is wishful thinking, that this is the more likely possibility. So if we're going to remove bad foods from systems and hopefully good ones will take their place, where are the logical places to start? Why begin, in other words, with sugar-sweetened beverages? Well, there's a very long list of reasons and some of them have been mentioned today. Single greatest source of added sugar in the American diet, completely empty calories, poor calorie compensation. And this was mentioned by two speakers. I think Mike brought it up originally and Tom Farley did. The body doesn't seem to recognize calories very well when they get delivered in beverages. And so the same number of calories in a beverage versus a solid food, it could be pizza, donuts, or ice cream for that matter, will result in, in poor body weight regulation. There's an interesting topic that I'd like to discuss in more detail in just a moment about whether sugar works on the brain as an addictive substance. There's the gratuitous addition of a known addictive substance, caffeine, sometimes in extremely high amounts. There's the targeting of vulnerable populations with the marketing. And then, at least in my mind, there's rock solid proof of harm with consumption of these beverages with links between diabetes, obesity, and sugar beverage consumption. So when somebody asks why begin with SSBs, we can say, let us count the ways. <clears throat> the links, the, the, the mechanisms linking sugar beverage consumption to poor health, health outcomes have been explicated recently. Here's an example of a paper that suggests that sugar beverage consumption is linked to negative health outcomes in these ways. Liquid calories, glycemic load, and the fructose enter the body, the consequence are these series of biological metabolic processes, and you end up with obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome as a consequence. So with this laid out, it looks like there are plenty of reasons to address sugar-sweetened beverages as a primary topic to begin the fight against obesity. One of the new topics on the scene is whether food works on the brain as an addictive substance. Um, this, in my mind, is a real game-changing way of looking at the world, and the research on this is becoming more compelling almost by the day. So I'd like to show some, share some of that with you. So first we can look at dramatic food changes. This is a paper, and I'm not intending for you to read the small print here, but a paper by Carlos Montero in Brazil who talks about this concept of ultra-processed foods. What happens when foods get, get processed in a way that the body is not very capable of dealing with? And then Ashley Gearhart and other people in our group wrote a paper on whether food can be addictive, and we talked about hyperpalatable foods, the same concept as ultra-processed food. And the idea works like this, that if you take the coca leaf, for example, out in nature, it's mildly reinforcing, but not sufficient that people would abuse it or overdo it with this. But when you process the coca leaf into cocaine, you process it even further into crack cocaine, then you've got a substance that the body is not capable of dealing with well. Personal responsibility and willpower go out the window and you have a health catastrophe. So how different is this ultra processing than when you take corn and you turn it into this, when you take wheat and you turn it into this, or when you take water and turn it into this? And is the body capable of handling these substances when consumed in amounts that are proposed so often by the industry? Now, I'm thinking a lot about the science of this because uh, I edited a book with a colleague, Mark Gold, that will be published in about September by Oxford University Press on this topic of food and addiction. 
And this is a collection of about 70 chapters from the people around the world who are studying this issue. And boy, does the evidence look compelling when you distill it all into a few common, common um, <coughs> um, findings. So, you well, know, actually, the slides are not the ones I, I was expecting. So, sorry. Let me say what the, what the research literature has shown. In animal models of this, food and addiction, you find that the, the hyperpalatable food, sugar in particular, activate the same brain reward pathways that you get activation from with heroin, morphine, nicotine, and alcohol. Nobody would argue that it's as strong of an effect as those highly addictive substances, but an addictive effect nonetheless. You get symptoms in both animal and human studies of withdrawal, of craving, and even with a, 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 a phenomenon called cross-sensitization, which means that if you're addicted to one substance, you're more likely to become addicted to others down the road. There might be evidence of tolerance in studies that are about to come out. That is, you may need more of the substance with time to get the same pharmacologic effect. And so doesn't this thwart the body's satiety mechanism when you're consuming the sugar, it has less activation of the reward pathways the more you consume it, and therefore you need to consume more to get the same biological effect, and therefore consumption would ratchet up with time, which is of course just exemplified or, or, or exaggerated by large portion sizes. So one interesting thing to ask ourselves is, what's the industry likely to do as this concept of food and addiction gets out there and becomes a reality? Um, first of all, I believe that this, the issue of food and addiction really is potentially a game changer. Uh, think, for example, of the legality or morality of selling foods in schools that are hijacking the brain because of an addictive process. Uh, couldn't this change the legal exposure of the food industry for intentional manipulation of ingredients that are triggering this biological process that leads to such catastrophic health consequences? So the industry will have to respond to this as this issue becomes more prominent. And what are they likely to do? Well, they will have a reliable script. Uh, they did it with tobacco. They did it with alcohol. They've done it with most other things as well. That they will first try to plant doubt that there's something wrong with the science, that there's not conclusive evidence that tobacco doesn't cause lung cancer. They will call studies junk science. The term gets used all the time. All of us in the room who have produced science that the industry doesn't like it have been had it labeled as junk science. They'll attack scientists as being biased and say that the work that they fund by other scientists is not biased. They will buy up scientists, many of us can name right now who they're likely to be, who will do studies showing that there is no link, no, no addictive link between consumption of these beverages and and um, negative health outcomes. And then once something like this becomes public and becomes a reality and people begin to base public policy on it, they will probably look to congressional leaders to pass shield laws that will brace themselves from lawsuits based on this addiction concept. So I think we can expect to see this coming. It will be very interesting to see it rolled out. Now this issue of addiction uh, comes into play in this concept about whether the companies are truly agnostic about what they sell. Now, the companies will say this. They say, we're just responding to demand, and if people want to buy our waters, our diet products, or our juices, we're just as happy. Wrong. People don't overconsume water. They tend not to overconsume healthy foods, but they do overconsume unhealthy versions of things, high in sugar, fat, and salt, with, of course, sugar being the, the issue of the day here. And so I don't believe the companies are agnostic at all. They have every reason in the world to push the high sugar versions of their products. Let's ask the companies, by the way, what they're pushing most in the developing world. Do you think it's water? And so in my belief, these two products are not equivalent in the eyes of the industry. And so there's this arresting reality that the companies must sell sugar in order to keep profit margins high because it's ultra palatable, the body doesn't recognize the calories very well, hence people will overconsume it, and this addictive process becomes a real issue. So what policies make sense in this context? Um, I think it's very, some really very fine work on modeling of policies to deal with obesity uh, uh, resulted in a series of papers published in The Lancet in 2011. And among those papers was one by Steve Gortmaker and colleagues on policies 
that look to be most cost effective in dealing with obesity. And just to take a table from that, you get a list of policies. Now, since you won't be able to read that, I've taken the top three policies that they recommended, unhealthy food and beverage taxes, front of package labeling so consumers know what they're getting, and reduce junk food marketing to kids. Boy, aren't these exactly the sort of things we're talking about here in public policy. So it's wonderful to have that empirical support looking at both the cost and the benefit of these policies when put out there. So I think this is groundbreaking work that Gortmaker and others have done. And it really shows what might be most effective out there in the world. So I was asked in this talk to discuss the concept of addiction, but also to do some prognostication about what we're going to see down the road. Uh, so it actually made me pause and think a little bit about what's likely to happen. So I'm going to give you five and 10 year prognostications. Now I can't do this any better than anybody else, but for my two cents, here's what it is. First of all, re reducing SSBs is something that is the, the public, public health priority in a lot of places around the country. We've heard some terrific examples of that today. But if you look at the number of things bearing down on this industry at the moment, it's really remarkable. So taxes, the thing they hate the absolute most, the thing they're fighting hardest against, are close to becoming a reality. And I wouldn't be surprised if many other places don't follow Philadelphia's lead and begin to pass these taxes. Next, lots of talk about restricting marketing. Next, what about all the scientific evidence and the way the news, um, the media is covering these beverages? That puts a lot of pressure on industry. Schools, boy, are they getting pressure to get out of schools. And this removes a branding opportunity for them that's very important. Next, if this will bring me to the next place. Yeah, for some reason, it's not working. I don't know. Oh, there we go. Uh, there's removing these beverages from municipal facilities. We've heard of several wonderful examples of that. And then I've skipped a box. I'm going to ask you to guess what you think is in that box that I've skipped. Next is the regulation of business practices. What New York City has done with asking for the permission, not asking for the permission, but, but wanting the health board to approve this ordinance to restrict portion sizes in New York City restaurant is historic from a legal point of view. Because it's really one of the first times a city health department has said, we have jurisdiction over the conduct of these companies, the way they do their business in, in reference to the long-term consequences of food. This has to, not to do with the marketing, but the actual sales of the product. And if this authority gets supported by their health board, it'll certainly be challenged in the courts. But if the courts upheld, uphold New York City ability to do this, just think where it could go next. What about the end of aisle displays in supermarkets when unhealthy foods are pushed? What about what's at eye level for children in the supermarket? Um, what about all the things that are done elsewhere in the food supply? This might really go some interesting places. Hospitals are cleaning out the junk foods. We saw examples of that. And lots of educational campaigns around the country. This is a lot for an industry to deal with. And they're going to have trouble putting out all of these fires. So many people are working on this in so many ways. And one of the beauties of this from a scientific point of view is that each one of these things becomes a natural experiment. So we'll get some sense of which approach might ultimately work the best if it can be done in a concerted way. And of course, what's in that missing circle at the bottom, litigation. Litigation was incredibly effective in the tobacco arena. Not individual plaintiff's lawsuits for the health consequences of tobacco, but large action lawsuits by the state attorneys general made a big difference in the war against tobacco. So my guess is that it probably won't be long before litigation gets launched in this arena and will have a big impact on public opinion, a big impact on the way the companies do business. So if I'm in one of those CEO seats right now, I'm not feeling too good about these things because I think it's applying a lot of pressure to industry. So here's my five-year prognostication. Now, you might look at this and say, well, Brownell, these are all your hopes of things you wish come true. Um, but I, I do believe these things will happen. First, I believe that addiction discussion will be prominent in public discourse about sugar-sweetened beverages. I think there will be none of these products in schools at all, period, end of story. There won't be fiddling around with sports drinks. What about the juices? I think they will be gone entirely. Next, I think city and state taxes will exist in a number of places. Somebody will go first. A lot of people will quickly go second, and we'll have many of these taxes. 
litigation will be underway, and then finally, sadly, the companies will be more profitable than ever despite these things. How will that be? The greatest shame of all is the exploitation of the developing world. Just like the tobacco companies are more profitable than ever because of high rates of smoking in the developing world, the food companies are showing every sign of it doing exactly the same thing. This press report of Coca-Cola seeing massive growth in the developing world and bragging about it is very concerning. Now in some ways, actions that we take here in the United States are permitting this to occur, if not hastening it because the companies have to remain profitable. If we're stopping their growth in the United States, they have to make it up somewhere else. What better place than these countries with massive populations, low levels of education, high opportunity for exploitation. So it would be wonderful if the world community starts to pay as much attention to this as the community is in the United States. I just returned from a trip from Mexico and talked with government and, and NGO authorities there uh, you may know that Mexico has the highest per capita consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages in the world. The government signed a deal with Coca-Cola not long ago where Coca-Cola would provide monies to improve playgrounds as long as the Coca-Cola logo gets to, stay in, gets to stay on the playgrounds. So boy, if you, there was ever a bargain with the devil, here it is. And this sort of thing is occurring around the world in country after country and it's of great concern if we are to be a world citizen. Here's my 10-year prognostication. Now again, I'm even less accurate on this in all likelihood, but here's where I think things may go. First of all, I think marketing will finally be restricted. Right now, it's very hard to deal with marketing because of the First Amendment, but there are very clever people out there working on the state and local authority over marketing, and eventually, there might be greater federal control over marketing. There just is no choice but to deal with this issue. In the absence of curtailment of marketing, it's hard to imagine we can deal with the obesity problem. Uh, the example that I give is that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation spends $100 million a year now in dealing with the childhood obesity problem, an absolute godsend to those of us who care about the issue. But the food industry spends that much every year by January 4th. Just marketing, just junk food, just to children. So how dire is this circumstance? Next, I don't believe SNAP benefits will be permitted to be used uh, for the purchase of sugar-sweetened beverages. I think city and state taxes will be ramping up at this point. Small taxes will begin, but just like with tobacco taxes ramping up, these will ramp it up as well. And I believe in 10 years, the federal tax will join the state and local taxes and we'll start to get something pretty substantial. Next is I expect there will be multi-state action against these companies by the state attorneys general. Uh, they become a very powerful potential force in this fight against obesity, and there are a number of legal grounds on which they can take on this issue, and I expect they will. A few of them are talking about it already, and there have been a few actions that have been very helpful. And then finally, finally, the companies will be suffering. Uh, they will have lost a lot of their business in the United States, and I think the global communities will have started to pay attention to this issue and will start to see the world consumption of these beverages decline, not just U.S. consumption. So I'll end with those prognostications. I'm sorry that Barry wasn't here for his talk. If you get a chance to hear him tomorrow, I urge you to do so because he sent me his slides in preparation for this and he has a really very good talk. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day.